Exodus, verses 21 and 22. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry land, and the waters were a wall to them on their right and on their left. Verses 27 and 28. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained. Okay, back to the modern world. Don't worry, I haven't had an epiphany and transformed into a podvangelist. As you may realize by now, those are excerpts from the book of Exodus about the infinitely famous story of the parting of the Red Sea. This cameo in the Bible has made the Red Sea the most famous sea in the whole world. I mean, Jerry Bruckheimer and Johnny Depp made the Caribbean Sea pretty famous with that pirate movie, but nothing boosts your rep for all eternity like a shout out in the Bible. On top of that, a lot of people in the West don't realize this, but the same story also makes an appearance in the holy book of another of the world's major religions. Yep, the story of Moses parting the Red Sea also shows up in the Quran in chapter 26, verses 60 through 67, or in Arabic, as chapters are called, a surah. So it's surah 26, verses 60 to 67 in the Quran. So bam, double validation. Actually, to be honest, it's still single validation. Since, as I've said before on here, and you'll know if you're up to speed on the origins of the world's religions, both Christianity and Islam believe in and share the Old Testament. So yeah. Both Muslims and Christians believe that Big Daddy Moses parted the Red Sea back in the day, saved the Israelites from the mean old Pharaoh's army chasing them across the desert, and then returned the waters to their rightful position to destroy Pharaoh's army, save the Israelites, and restore those beautiful beaches for you to savor and enjoy today. Or soon, anyway. Just to set the scene, let me take a moment to define precisely what we're talking about when we say the Red Sea. This is essentially a long and relatively narrow, in the grand scheme of things, body of water that lies between the northeast coast of Africa and the Arabian Peninsula. This is probably TMI, but just for the geography nerds out there, the Red Sea is pinched off at its southern end by the narrow channel that separates Djibouti, yeah, that's the country, and Yemen, known as the Bab al-Mandab Straits. Actually, and I'm doing tangents pretty early in this episode, but just this will be a quick one. I only know the name of that strait because I had to do a case study on it in an international conflict resolution class as an undergrad one time, and I picked the conflict over some random islands in the Bab al-Mandab Straits and wrote too many pages on some bickering over those rocks. Anywho, in addition to Yemen and Djibouti, yeah, it's still a country, Eritrea, Sudan, Egypt, Israel, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia all have coastal territory encircling the Red Sea. And despite some of those countries being red flags for war and conflict, The Red Sea is a remarkably peaceful and conflict-free body of water, except for a brief period decades ago in the Bab al-Mandab Straits like I was talking about, which, by the way, is nowhere near Egypt, which is what we're solely concerned with here. Okay, so now let's turn back to Egypt and dive into talking in detail about its Red Sea coast and what's so awesome about it. Well, some of it. Actually, much of it. So when we refer to Egypt's Red Sea coast with respect to tourism, we're really talking about two main areas. The eastern coastal portion of Egypt on the African continent, or what I call Egypt proper, and the eastern coast of the Sinai Peninsula, which is also owned by Egypt, part of Egypt. Now, there are two points to clarify here. First, some geography Nazis don't consider the stretch of water that borders the Sinai Peninsula's eastern and western sides to technically still be the Red Sea. They would yell at me and call them the Gulf of Aqaba to the east of Sinai and the Gulf of Suez to the west of Sinai, respectively. But practically and colloquially speaking, we still call those Red Sea beaches. So the strict constructionists out there can just suck it. It's still an arm of the Red Sea. And you can tell if you look at the Red Sea on a map. Now notice I left one major area off, namely the Sinai Peninsula's western coast along the Gulf of Suez. That's because there's nothing there, or at least nothing worth visiting at all. Trust me. If you want to test me, go hang out there with the three flies and two fish that inhabit that coast and you'll take my word for it next time. All right, back to civilization. The Red Sea coast of Egypt proper and the eastern coast of the Sinai, including the tip of the peninsula, are really where it's at when it comes to the Red Sea. And actually, that applies to the whole Red Sea, not just Egypt's Red Sea. As I mentioned earlier, eight countries border the Red Sea, but Egypt is really where it's at when it comes to the best and most accessible resorts. 
Jordan and Israel each have tiny slivers of Red Sea coast, and they both have cities on them that boast beach and diving and resorty stuff, but they ain't got nothing on Egypt's hundreds and hundreds of miles of beautiful Red Sea beaches. Just to give you an idea of the vast difference, Israel has about six miles of Red Sea coastline, and Jordan has about 30 miles of Red Sea coastline, but Egypt has 900 miles of Red Sea coastline with many different towns and cities, large and small, local and touristy, resorty, natural, everything in between. Egypt's really where the party is on the Red Sea, for both literally partying and for relaxing. As for other Red Sea destinations, well, who's ever heard of going to Sudan or Djibouti for their beaches? Nobody, right? And Saudi Arabia, who goes there for tourism at all? Seriously, you might get a nice burqa tan around your eyes there, but Saudi just has a whole lot of wasted empty desert along its Red Sea coast. And Yemen, well... Yeah, I think that speaks for itself. You don't want a vacation there. So 900 miles of Red Sea coast to choose from in Egypt. Where should you go when you want to visit the Red Sea? All right, that depends on where you're coming from and what you're looking to do once you get there. I really consider there to be seven destinations along the Red Sea coast of Egypt proper that are worth mentioning and four along the coast of the Sinai, all on the Gulf of Aqaba side or the eastern side of the Sinai Peninsula. In Egypt proper, Remember, this is the coast of Egypt along the African continent. In Egypt proper, the main destinations are Ain Sukhna, Ras Garab, El Guna, Hergada, Safaga, Kusir, and Marsa Alam. Now, some of those aren't really destinations for foreign tourists, but are considered by Egyptians to be resort destinations because they're on the coast and have some hotels and some tourist infrastructure like restaurants and bus stops and the like. Ras Garab, Safaga, and Kusir fall squarely into this category. I just mentioned them in case you're doing other research on Red Sea destinations and you come across them, just so you'll know that, yeah, technically they're resorty places on the Red Sea, but as a foreign visitor, you're not really going to find what you're looking for in a Red Sea visit in one of those places. They're more local beach escapes for Egyptians when they want to escape the hustle and bustle of the Nile Valley, and you won't find so many foreign tourists there. Ein Sokna kind of falls into this category too, but I have known some Westerners to spend a weekend there every now and then because It's the closest beach on the Red Sea to Cairo. But for that same reason, it also tends to be flooded with local families from Cairo who want a beach getaway without the longer drive or flight required to get to some of the more popular places on the Red Sea. So that leaves us with El Guna, Hergada, and Marsa Alam as the three major resort destinations along the Red Sea coast of Egypt proper. Okay, so let's talk about each of them real quick, starting with the one further south and working our way up the coast. Marsa Alam is the farthest away, so you definitely have to fly to get there. Now, flights aren't that expensive within Egypt, maybe 100 to 150 bucks each way on average. Then it's just a quick cab ride to any of the beach resorts in Marsa Alam, spreading out for miles north and south of the city. There are a few hotel brands here that Westerners would recognize, but most of the properties are Egyptian and regional hospitality companies, but there's still some very nice ones in Marsa Alam. Okay, further up the coast, you have the largest city along Egypt's Red Sea coast on the African side which is Hergada. Hergada is really popular with European package holiday goers, and it's the second most marketed Red Sea destination. There are even direct flights here from several European cities, and trust me, they're all packed full of discount holiday package tourists. I personally am not a fan of Hergada for this reason, plus the fact that the town itself isn't really well developed for such a major destination. And I don't even find the resorts there that nice, to be honest, or the ones I've seen at least. Of course, I haven't been to every resort there, so if I do find one that blows me away in the future or that I can recommend in the future, I will be sure to let everyone know in an update. I'm just letting you know that the time I've spent in in Hergada, the exploring I've done, the resorts I've seen, have not impressed me at all. But Hergada is accessible by both road and air. It has a major airport, which not only serves several cities in Egypt, but as I mentioned a minute ago, also has direct flights to and from several European cities too. But Hergada is only about a five-hour drive from Cairo and a four-hour drive from Luxor, so it's possible to build in a visit here without needing to deal with the hassle of airports if you prefer road trips. In fact, many of those package holiday tourists that I was talking about that only go to Hergada to get their leather tan on will take day trip excursions by bus to Luxor and come back to Hergada in the same day. I've also taken the same route between Hergada and Luxor many times by road, and I've taken many other guests on that same route as well. It's a perfectly safe and well-traveled road, and so is the road between Cairo and Hergada, too, by the way. 
Okay, further up that road, about 20 minutes or so from Hergada, is my absolute favorite place along Egypt's Red Sea coast, which you may have heard me mention before in previous episodes, and that's the resort town of El Guna. El Guna is actually a planned seaside community, so the entire town and surrounding area is newer and much nicer than all the other Red Sea towns. And that goes for both the Sinai part and the um, and Egypt proper on the African side. So based on this, you might be thinking now, oh, come on, John, why would you send us to some planned development when we're here to see the real Egypt and enjoy authentic experiences? And my answer to that is this, everything else you'll be doing in Egypt will be the real Egypt. I'm doing air quotes here. You'll be seeing plenty of what makes Egypt still a very developing country including the overcrowdedness and the poverty and the shabby roads and so much more, even if you're staying at the Four Seasons. You can't avoid it. You see it if you visit the sites because it's all around them, and that's what you came to Egypt to do. When you visit the Red Sea, though, you're going to want to relax. You're not going to want things to be developing there. You want a nice experience and beautiful surroundings, and nowhere has framed that natural beauty and complemented it with modern conveniences better than El Guna, in my honest and humble opinion. El Guna's got it all. It's got Big, all-inclusive resorts, small, quaint B&Bs, local and even Western restaurants, a few bars, a little nightlife, great roads, easy transportation between areas, and none of the hassling you get in other parts of Egypt. The town really is a little slice of paradise on the coast of Egypt where you can let your hair down and relax and not worry about anything else and just enjoy the beautiful beaches and great weather and that constant radiating sun. Now, I know this sounds like an ad for the town, but I promise they're not paying me to say that. They should, given how much I rave about this place and how many people I've taken there. But I do so because I truly, genuinely love it myself that much. Not many foreigners know about El Guna, and those that do aren't the package holiday tourist types. And while El Guna is a playground for Egypt's upper crust, it isn't exorbitantly expensive by our standards at all. The town has a a super cute marina, actually two now, I think, um, that's always filled with you know, small yachts and big yachts and the restaurants and cafes and bars lining the marina are just so cute. And they're actually really, really good quality. Now, all of these places I've mentioned, Marsa Alam, Hergada, and El Guna, offer all of the outdoor activities and water sports that you'd expect to find along the Red Sea, including boating excursions, snorkeling, four-wheeling, which they call quad biking there, by the way, and scuba diving. And in fact, you may know this already, but the Red Sea is known as one of the world's major scuba diving destinations. So The scuba industry in this whole area is pretty advanced. You can even learn to scuba dive in Egypt for really cheap compared to prices back home. And I've known a lot of people that go to the Red Sea and hang out there for a week or a couple of weeks, specifically to take advantage of the low prices, learning to scuba dive and getting certified. All right, now let's move over to the Sinai and talk about Egypt's Red Sea towns over there. Obviously, the biggest and most famous Red Sea resort town of all is Sharm el Sheikh. It's at the southern tip of the peninsula, a little bit to the east of the tip, actually. And this is by far the most developed area on the Sinai Peninsula. Sharm has a lot of Western brand properties that you will have heard of, and a lot more Egyptian and regional Arab brands that you probably won't have heard of. But it won't be hard to find a resort property in or near Sharm that you'll know to be nice and that'll be affordable too. Sharm also has a really advanced scuba diving and water sports industry because of the high levels of tourism there. And like Hergada, there are direct flights to Sharm from Europe and Russia and many other places in the Middle East and Asia. But if you're already in Egypt, you can easily also get there by air from Cairo multiple times a day, and even from Hergada and Luxor by air as well. Now, you can drive to Sharm from Cairo, but you don't want to do that. It's just too long of a drive, and you'll waste a lot of your precious time in country passing through ugly wasteland that's not even scenic. I've done it several times for various reasons, but Don't get tricked into taking a car or bus to Sharm from Cairo or from Hergada or anywhere in Egypt proper because you'll regret it. It's a cheap flight like everywhere else in Egypt, and the airport is super small and super convenient to the city. So you really want to fly to Sharm no matter where you're coming from. Now, you'll also want to fly into the Sharm airport if you want to go to any of the other popular but smaller beach towns along the Gulf of Aqaba on the eastern shore of the Sinai Peninsula, like Dahab or Nueva. Okay, these two coastal towns over there are really chill and laid back and inexpensive, even for Egypt. They're kind of known for having a hippie beach vibe. And frankly, most of the people I've known to spend time there do so to smoke pot and lay on the beach and and hang out in the beach huts. That's personally not my scene, but if that's your scene, then you'll love Dahab and Nueva. Just remember, though, that pot is illegal in Egypt. Illegal. 
as in not legal. If you're a tourist and you get caught by police, in all honesty, they're probably just going to ask you for a sizable bribe and let you go after scaring you a little bit to jack up the bribe amount. I've heard of police officers in Egypt seriously cleaning tourists out of anywhere from like 100 bucks to $800 or so by telling them that they're looking at spending time in prison before the courts even have a chance to hear their case and that the U.S. Embassy can't help them when it comes to drugs and that Egypt has the death penalty for drugs. And, you know, some of that's true, but some of it's not. But you really might be thrown in jail for a while if they catch you with larger amounts or suspect you of selling or, or dealing there. If you're going to Egypt as a tourist, please just trust me and wait a couple of extra days until you're back home or at least until you're out of the country to do your thing. It's just not worth the hassle. And it's also, frankly speaking and culturally speaking, it's kind of disrespectful because drugs and even alcohol are very offensive to Islamic societies, although Egypt does tolerate legal alcohol consumption. So if you like to drink like me, you'll be good there. But just don't do the drug thing in Egypt. So anyway, I warn you about the bribery scheme that a lot of police have going on just in case you find yourself in that situation so you'll know what to expect. But I also plead with everyone to just have a few drinks back at your hotel in a bar somewhere if you want to relax. Don't risk those drug stuff in Egypt. Poor Baba War. All right, enough on Dahab and Nueva. Although please don't let me give you the wrong idea. They're not just pothead hangouts, I promise. They're also very lovely and very chill, small beachside communities, Dahab and Nueva. And they're very beautiful and very cheap. So they're somewhat popular destinations along the Sinai's Red Sea coast too, but they're ones that are not so crowded with the professional tourists like Sharma or Hergata. Now there's one more city on the same strip of coast called Taba that's worth mentioning for informational purposes. Although I don't think it's really worth taking the time to go there if you're coming from the US or Europe for Egypt's Red Sea beaches. You know, I say that because there are much nicer and more easily accessible places to get on the Red Sea like Sharm or my favorite Elguna, if you're coming all the way from across another sea or an ocean to get to Egypt and spend a while there. Taba is more of a destination for Egyptians and for some really El Chipo Euro package holidays, and even for a lot of Israelis, if you can believe it. Taba is right across the border from Israel, and they can cross the border there with a cheaper and quicker Sinai-only visa and just hit the cheaper Egyptian beaches on that stretch along the Gulf of Aqaba. So you do see some Israelis sunning it up in Taba too. With all of that said, though, regular readers of the Egypt Travel Blog and listeners to the Egypt Travel Blog podcast will know what I'm about to say here about the rest of the Sinai Peninsula. It's an interesting region. It's steeped in both biblical and modern history and significance. But right now, and even the Egyptian government will readily admit this, and many Egyptians will tell you this too, the interior of the Sinai is not exactly the safest place to venture off and wander off into, even with a guide or anything like that. The coastal roads in the Sinai are well policed and guarded and traveled and are generally fine, especially on this southeastern side of the peninsula we've been talking about when we're talking about Sharm el-Sheikh and Dahab and Nueva and Taba. But the government has had some trouble controlling the interior of this sparsely populated peninsula, so we generally all recommend against visiting there right now. With that said, however, there are always exceptions. All right. Mount Sinai and St. Catherine's Monastery at its base are in the southern interior part of the Sinai, pretty much smack dab in the middle between the eastern and western coastal roads down in the southern part. Now, that remains a popular day trip from Sharm or from the other coastal Sinai resort towns, and it's usually safe and okay. I've been there many times, and only once have I ever seen the roads into that site closed for security reasons, which meant we had to drive around the whole tip of the peninsula and back up the other side to access it from the road coming in from the other side of the Sinai Peninsula. It was about an extra four or five hour journey, but the guests I was with really wanted to go climb Mount Sinai and it was totally worth it for them. Actually, this is a funny story. The reason they really wanted to make it to Mount Sinai was because one of them was planning to propose to his fiance on top of Mount Sinai, which he did when we finally made it there. and. It was really special. We all teared up because she totally didn't see it coming at all. And I love helping make special moments like that happen in Egypt for guests. It's, you know, it's really truly a joy to help plan and bring stuff like that to life in a setting in Egypt, like on top of Mount Sinai. Anyway, back to the topic of this episode, the Red Sea, to wrap it up. We've actually covered the towns and cities and resorts up and down the mainland coast on Egypt's African side and up and down Egypt's eastern Sinai coast. And between the two of those stretches, that's really where all the best Red Sea action is at a 
not only Egypt, but all the countries that border the Red Sea. So if that gets you wanting to wade into the Red Sea's cool turquoise water this winter, when it's freezing back home in North America and Europe, consider coming to visit me in Egypt. Remember, egypttravelblog.com if you want to read up on more about traveling to and around Egypt. egyptelite.com if you want to check out traveling with me and my awesome team there. Even if you are not traveling with me or my, my team, you just have questions about Egypt, you're traveling with somebody else, you want to know about itinerary recommendations or things like that, you want to know if you're traveling with somebody sketch or somebody I've heard of, email me. I am more than happy to help anybody who's a listener to this podcast, whether you travel with me in Egypt or not. Don't worry. I'm John at EgyptTravelBlog.com. That's J-O-H-N, John at EgyptTravelBlog.com if you want to reach out. I promise I'm never bothered by emails. I get back to them as quickly as I can. Sometimes they get caught in a spam filter. I fish them out when I remember to go check the spam filter, but I promise I answer all of them. I try to get back as quickly as I can, and I promise I'll respond to you. And one more thing, you know what I'm going to say next. If you have a moment, please go leave the Egypt Travel Blog podcast a five-star rating and a nice review on iTunes because it helps boost the podcast so that others can find it and benefit from all the same essential insider info that you're getting here about your upcoming trip to Egypt. We've all got to help each other out and support each other. And that's what I'm endeavoring to do here for everyone who finds this podcast. I love it. I love Egypt. I love all of you for tuning in. And until next time, my friends, Masalama. Hey, everybody. John Navar here again with a post-show update this time. I didn't want to ruin that scene-setting biblical intro I did here for a pre-show update like I've done in other episodes. So this one is coming afterwards. While everything in this fall 2018 episode remains the same now in the summer of 2022 with regards to the Red Sea and my recommendations for where to go and where not to go to get a piece of it, there is one additional new spot that has popped up and grown in popularity over the past five years that you also need to know about now, and that is Soma Bay. Soma Bay is a new luxury resort development just south of Hergada, so it's accessible either by flying into Hergada's airport or driving over from Lux 